got a fantastic panel today, a lot to cover. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over to Jill first and get everybody to introduce themselves. My name is Jill Malandrino. I'm the global market reporter at NASDAQ, also the creator and host of the show of NASDAQ Trade Talks, our number one social and digital program covering all things that touch the capital markets. Of course, that includes digital assets and why we're here today, personal finance, business trends, sports, entertainment. So we really won the full gamut of uh, what touches the capital market space. My name is Rachel Wolfson. I'm a reporter for Cointelegraph. Um, I've written for publications including HuffPost, Bitcoin Magazine, and Forbes, just to name a few. I'm currently working on a book on enterprise blockchain. I just published an ebook on Amazon about Bitcoin. <laughs> um, so it's there. And then um, I used to have a podcast called The Crypto Chick. And I'm also an analyst for the firm Quantum Economics. Based, used to be based in the Bay Area, but I just moved to Austin, Texas, which I'm really excited about. Lovely to see you all, Jimmy, uh, Alex, really cool to see you, Rachel as well. Um, I've put a VESA piece of art behind me in honor of your book cover. So there we go. He did that. Yeah, um, yeah I'm James Bowder. Um, three years ago, I created Crypto AM in London City AM newspaper, uh, which is the foremost uh, uh, handout paper in the financial sector, uh, covering the Square Mile and, and Canary Wharf and all the commuter stations. And uh, three years later, we're still here, having established it in crypto winter, which seems a long time ago. And uh, yes, it's gone from strength to strength, and we've just come out of the Crypto AM Awards, which were hugely successful. Rachel, I think um, you were nominated in that. So um, it was a really good night, and you would have, um, you'd have loved it very much. Well, still relatively nascent, the digital asset industry on paper represents several trillion dollars of wealth in what many would describe as a fast maturing space. As the digital asset industry has developed, how have you seen coverage of the space evolve? Well, I think, you know, my particular mission was always to translate um, the, uh, what we're doing in the crypto world, um, digital asset space, blockchain world, to the traditional finance sector of, of London and, 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 and a broader audience. Um, you know, explain, you know, what, what was an ICO? No one knew that. Um, but that was, that was three years ago. And um, everyone has talked about institutional adoption this, but everyone forgets that everything is based on uh, regulation. Um, and I think that the more that the regulators have started to put sensible frameworks in place, the more the institutions can start getting involved and therefore the digital asset space has taken on real meaning. And we've seen it now, um, you've seen the, the, the entire market cap, you know, um, uh, you know, catapulting uh, beyond two uh, two trillion dollars. So, I mean, it's a significant thing, and a lot of the naysayers have become yaysayers as well. Um, I wonder, I wonder why <laughs> they missed the first one. So they're probably trying to make sure they're involved in the in the second. But definitely, it has to do with the ability for institutions to actually be allowed to participate with clients' money, and I think that's been a massive change. And there are uh, very very good jurisdictions and very slow jurisdictions so i mean hopefully there will be some sort of balance um uh, globally sooner rather than later which will make things a lot easier how does uh, that compare to your own take on the the evolution of coverage of the digital asset space when you think about it, where I come from, so I work for NASDAQ, which is a fintech company that powers the global capital markets, and of course we have our exchange business as well. So we tackle the coverage of crypto a little bit differently than um, some of the more niche organizations that are out there. We're coming at it from an investor perspective. Um, what are we doing to educate the retail base? What are we doing to educate our institutional clients and partners? How are we working with the regulators? So we'll be looking at things more like um, indexes, or, or ETFs, or how institutions are adopting it within their portfolios. How is it recommended for a, a retail investor to incorporate it into their investment plan? So we're looking at it a little bit more holistically and definitely take more of an institutional slant. But we think of ourselves as a way to educate the um, investor marketplace versus looking at something as specific as different projects that are launching all the time and all the different kinds of exchanges. What's really interesting is we look at it through the lens of market technology and data. So I think that's what we kind of bring to the table that might be um, a little bit different than um, you know, the experts within the niche space.
Right, and, and for me, I focus on enterprise, and I've been focused on enterprise blockchain since 2017 when I started writing about this industry. So with Cointelegraph specifically, a lot of my coverage is enterprise focused. So rather than focusing on the market or prices or digital assets, I focus specifically on how enterprises are using blockchain as a technology to help with things such as supply chain management, for instance. Um, and I've also been noticing a lot of great use cases here with the BSV blockchain for enterprise, which is wonderful because I believe that having that enterprise adoption is helping mature the entire space, um, you know, digital assets included. So I think that enterprise adoption is really important, and that's why my coverage is focused specifically on enterprise. So I might turn to you now, Rachel. Um, do you think that overall the quality and the quantity of coverage that we're seeing in the digital asset space reflects the increasingly prominent role that it's playing in our digital economy? Some of the coverage out there is really great. For instance, myself, I prefer long form coverage, so I don't like writing 500 word pieces that I, you know, I get a press release and I regurgitate it. I never do that. So I do my research and I think that the longer form pieces that are well researched and thought out um, actually have a bigger impact than the little short news pieces that you read that could just be fluff. I mean, I get so many press releases and obviously fake news is a huge thing here. You've really got to do your research when you get these press releases. I mean, like the Walmart Litecoin story, it's story, like, it sounds great in the press release. You're like, whoa, this is amazing. I'm going to be the first journalist to break this story for Cointelegraph, you know, for instance. But at the end of the day, you've really got to do your research. And so that's why my articles specifically are all long form, well thought out. And I oftentimes I don't meet embargoes because I don't look at those embargoes. I'm like, this is a great story. I'm going to spend a few days researching it and writing it. And I always tell the, the PR people, I'm not going to meet the embargo because that's just not my style of journalism. So I think that's really important in terms of coverage for this space. To Rachel's point, I think there's something to be said about investigative journalism or longer form journalism. Even for, for my show, and what's so interesting, um, distributing media through an exchange, um, we don't report on things like announcements like Walmart and Litecoin. And Rachel and I, as long as we've been in the business, the timing of it, the wording of it, as soon as I saw that, I'm like, this is not the way Walmart times its press releases. Uh, so that was, that was our first clue, I would imagine. Um, a lot of the pitches that I get, because my show looks at longer term strategy, I'm not interested in earnings announcements, I'm interested in funding rounds, I want you on in my show in three to four weeks because I am booked out that far and I want to have the time to do the research and the due diligence because to Rachel's points, I might get 50 to 75 pitches on different projects that are happening all day long and there's no way that you can you know, truly leverage your resources within the industry to figure out what's valid and what's not. But I will say for the industry in terms of media distribution and coverage, I started off in equity trading in 1998. And as the equity business or more traditional asset classes have evolved, we were testing out different distribution channels to get your word out there, whether it was distributing through compliance to the street, whether it was leveraging blogs and now social media and newsletters and so forth. I feel like the um, digital asset space is in the sweet spot of um, legacy asset businesses already having to go through those minefields to feel what works. And I feel like the digital asset space is doing a really good job in terms of distribution of content, for sure. And so I guess for, for all the things that are going right, the Litecoin story that you both touched on, it still showed that there's a long way to go in this space in terms of reporting. I, mean, I wonder, Jill, if you maybe want to comment in what you think went so wrong there and how that fake news was able to proliferate so quickly. My first inclination was just the timing of it and, and, and having been through so many Walmart press releases in my lifetime, it just seemed very suspect to me as soon as it came out. Um, just, it wasn't even a conversation as much in the industry, but just through the, the timing of it, um, as you know, many of us in this room are well aware of, there's also kind of a gut feeling. You, know, you learn this in Series 7 101, if your gut is questioning yourself, there's probably a reason why. So it wasn't anything as intricate where I you know, had certain algos or something going, it just, it just wasn't indicative of patterns that we follow in, in press releases of companies that size. Whenever I get a press release from a major organization like Walmart or Target, you know, a major enterprise, I always, well with my articles, I always reach out for additional comments because I don't just look at the press release and regurgitate it. But I reach out and I say, hey, can I speak with Walmart about this announcement? So I think that, you know, whoever covered it should probably, you know, they should, they should try to get those original comments versus just looking at a press release and trusting that all that information is accurate. Um, 
there's, there's never been a time when I haven't reached out to a company when I get a press release for comments. And when I get comments from an enterprise like Walmart, for instance, I mean, that makes the article so much better to have those original comments versus just comments in a press release that every other reporter is going to have. And that also will help showing, you know, is this story legit or is it not legit? What's Walmart saying? Because I guess the, the other crucial element of that story was that the fake news, it proliferated so quickly, but it led to a 20% rise in the price of Litecoin almost immediately. And so I guess with, with crypto markets, with always open, always on markets, the lack of a, a regulator to intervene, to halt trading, to see what's going on, does the media bear a higher responsibility than in traditional markets, given that lack of, uh, lack of regulation or lack of ability to intervene? We're not news wire services, right? So, it, it, like I said, it's not like we have algorithms that are picking up these headlines and they're putting it out onto their platforms. Um, and, and what we do is a different style of, of writing. Um, I, I also think, and, and this is nothing new, I mean, this has been happening in the equity industry for, for years. You have prop traders that trade specifically off of headlines. They take that risk, and, and that, that's, that's the nature of prop trading. And that's what I think you're seeing in the industry, whether it's right, whether it's wrong, regardless if it's, if it's um, regulated, that, that's a risk that you and your firm take on. But in terms of trading headlines, this is nothing new. I wonder, James, um, in July, Crypto AM, you guys broke a, a not too dissimilar story with Amazon and Bitcoin potentially uh, accepting payments there. Um, but it's yeah. still one that you guys ended up taking a lot of heat for. I wonder if you could maybe contrast the, the Litecoin and the, the Walmart was, story. It was a pretty horrific situation, actually. I mean, uh, Darren Parkin, who I brought on as editor for um, Crypto AM from you know journalistic standpoint, um, so he's, he's he's the editor of Crypto AM. He uh, he he had the story, and it actually was on a Sunday, uh, and as you rightly say, it's twenty sixth of July. Um, and 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 what sort of ensued was this sort of Twitter storm. Uh, I think Kobe, um, you know, um, the 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 you know quite well followed Twitter guy who's always a bit of a joker, sort of effectively said that, you know, oh, I conned some sort of, you know, stupid British hack into BS story on Amazon. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that the story was verified. And, and as Rachel said, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, Darren is a, is a veteran of, 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 of Fleet Street and um, he knows he knows how to do it and what to, what's right and what's wrong and fact check and verify, confirm. I mean, you know, even when John McAfee, um, uh, died, you know, and he was very close to the McAfee's in terms of reporting. And, uh, you know, he would, even he would not confirm the death until such time as he had confirmation of death from the Spanish authorities. So with the Amazon story, it was a true um, verified story. Um, and, you know, the, the I mean, it, it was actually pretty horrific. When I said horrific, it was, I mean, he got death threats. I mean, you know, because if you remember, the, the market moved pretty 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 steeply pretty quickly across the board about 10 percent but it coincided with some short squeezing and a lot of people lost their shirt and the and, and the abuse that he got for it was pretty astonishing and of course the other thing uh, again going back to regulation and all of the other stuff if you look at what 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 happens when you know elon musk does something and and twitters up and and, and then suddenly you know dogecoin you know flies off to the moon um yeah the, it just goes to show the power that people do have, and to use that sort of Spider-Man phrase, you know, it's, it's you know, with 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 great power comes a great responsibility. And I think that, you know, going into this into this discussion, I mean, it's verification of facts as much as anything, uh, wherever possible. And then if if you can't verify, don't publish. I mean, it's it, it is. It is that, but then of course we are in a 24 hour news cycle. We're in a social media world where clickbait is absolutely de rigueur. And then also there are people who want to deliberately move the market and pump things. But it, it just, it, that, I mean, that Amazon story got completely out of hand, but I completely stand behind Darren's, um, Darren's research and, and uh, his, um, and, and actually the, the, the conversations he had. And ironically, I think there was an even a more senior executive of Amazon who was prepared to go on record should it be needed. But actually, I think the whole thing sort of died off. And when Amazon realized probably that the market um, had moved um, off the back of it, um, it was quite easy to say not this year, which was their denial. So, you know, it, it's, it, you, you've got to roll with it. Um, you know, I think that there will always be situations where people get it wrong, even if they've done the best research. 
but that's a huge difference between you know i mean i think the litecoin walmart story which which i think we reported was an elaborate hoax so somebody was behind that you know so there, there, there is there are, there are there are different there are different forces at hand you know um with different agendas but i mean as an independent um newspaper we try to be uh, always as as as, as, as solid as we can when it comes to reporting. Talk quite a bit now about the verification of stories. So I wonder maybe taking a step back now and thinking about selecting stories. I mean, when you think about the multi-trillion dollar digital asset space, it's comprised of thousands and thousands of coins, big claims, big personalities. When you're thinking about trying to select these stories, what goes into that? How do you define what is newsworthy and what what is going to get into the paper? I mean, do you want to maybe start with that, Rachel? Sure. So that's a great question. I'm not a news writer for Cointelegraph. So, you know, like I said, I do long form articles that are usually published after the embargo. So for me, I focus on like enterprise stuff, obviously. And sometimes my articles aren't the most exciting breaking news stories ever. But at the end of the day, they're well thought out, well researched, and they're completely, they're, they're legitimate. So I think that, you know, when, when we get a press release, like going back to the Walmart Litecoin thing, people are so excited and they want to be the first to break that. But, but, you know, you've got to think about the research that needs to go into these pieces. So like I was saying, my pieces are long form, they're well thought out. Um, I, I don't write news, but I focus on the enterprise. A big thing for me is when I can get comments from a major company, that's always something that I look for. So if there's something like a startup working with, with Walmart, for instance, or Visa, there's a lot of those now, startups with Visa, I always say, okay, great, can I get comments from you guys along with Visa? And I think that's what really makes my stories that aren't news more interesting um, than just, you know, saying like, great, there's a startup doing this with Visa, let me talk to you startup and get your comments. So I always look at it from the angle of, you know, where are the most interesting, exciting, you know, how to make this piece interesting and exciting. And I think having comments from a big company like Visa makes my pieces a little bit more newsworthy because they aren't news stories, if that makes sense. And I guess I might turn to you next, James, because you, obviously the editor of Crypto AM, you have a very broad mandate. What goes into it for you when you're selecting what is a newsworthy story? I'm, I'm an editor at large, so I, I suppose um, I consider me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a journalist. I've always maintained that I'm not a journalist. I just created Crypto AM with a mission to educate um, and uh, and also connect the community. Um, but as as you know, with 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 the journalists uh, now on board. Um, uh, it, it's again. It, it, it's making sure that um, it's germane to the to the narrative at the time. Uh, if there is something particularly interesting that catches your eye, but as as Rachel says, I mean, you know, you get you get you get absolute avalanches of of of, of, of stuff landing in your inbox. So um, selection tends to be a little bit instinctive. I think. Um, <laughs> I think. Darren's having a right of time with, with NFTs because I don't think he quite gets them. <laughs> so he, he's like, I don't understand how they're doing so much. Um, and sort of give, give, give your money to charity instead of buying a rock. Anyway, I mean, they, but they all have their all have their right place. But I think I think it's it, it's very much um, a lot of a lot of it is is a sense of monitoring everything that's going on. Um, and also, as I, you know, we've got a, a fairly broad team now, so I mean, you know, we can we can sort of see which is which is the most interesting at the time. I guess for you, Jill, you have such a broader mandate. You don't just do crypto, you do business as a whole. When you're selecting your stories, do you look for different things in a, a crypto story versus a typical business story? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so while I have a marketing and, and social department that supports the show, I am my editor and booker at large, which is how Jimmy gets on my show whenever he wants to come on. And, <laughs> and so I, I look at it through the lens of um, what correlates to what we're talking about in other areas of the capital market. So for example, ESG is, is just everywhere these days. Um, and the argument whether it's green, green rushed or not is, is another conversation. But so if I get a pitch, for example, with um, the amount of energy that mining is using for all different types of digital assets, that's something that is interesting. Um, when we talk about fintech and how payment processors 
are really um, the du jour of technology these days. When I hear about crypto teaming up with legacy payment processors or with newer ones like Square, that is something that's exciting to me because it's something our audience can understand. We are so broad because it's social and digital from retail investors, institutional investors, money managers to the digital crowd. So I'm looking for things that um, we're following in the traditional asset space and how we can marry legacy to newer technologies and, and newer asset classes to kind of bridge that gap. I agree with you there. So when I get a press release showing that a startup is working with Visa or MasterCard or Square or any of these traditional payment giants, that's so interesting to me because it's showing that the crypto space is bridging with traditional finance. And so, yeah, I mean, those stories are great. I love covering that. And James, what you said about NFTs, I'm so sick of seeing NFT press releases in my inbox. That's the majority. I mean, it's just insane, like, what we're seeing right now in the space. It reminds me of the ICO craze. And it's like, this is the NFT craze. And it's overwhelming, and it's hard to decide which story to cover when it comes to NFTs. It's insane. It's almost like as excited as people are with the digital asset space, it almost cannibalizes itself sometimes. So something catches on with an NFT, and then everybody has an NFT. Like, all right, I'm going to take my first Trade Talks episode and make that an NFT, you know, hopefully be a millionaire and retire. Probably not. But it's, you know, when, when um, we were talking about how the influence of someone like an Elon Musk when he makes a comment about crypto, we have so many people that are believing in the adoption of crypto assets, but when it's being peppered on social media and you don't have someone like a Rachel who's doing the research behind it, that it's, you're almost cannibalizing these projects and all of these efforts. So, you know, I, I kind of stay in my lane of how we can tell the institutional story where we're bridging that, that legacy and um, newer asset class gap. So with the NFT craze that we're seeing right now, with all the coverage, I think a lot of people, including like the mainstream, for instance, they have it in their mind that if they own an NFT, they're, they're going to get rich off of it because there's so much coverage with NFTs. I mean, that's not, that's not what this is. It's not like I own an NFT, I'm going to sell it, you know, and get rich. I mean, I think people need to understand the broader story behind NFTs, for instance, that not all of these are gold. Some are, some aren't. But when we see media coverage of NFTs, a lot of the times it's like, oh yeah, this, this NFT and it's going to blow up this and that, and then the mainstream thinks, gosh, I need to own an NFT, right? So I think there just needs to be better, more well-researched coverage on NFTs, and you know, probably stories out there saying why NFTs aren't all gold. The NFT trade, uh, the NFT craze, and the way that it's covered, in, in many respects you could apply that to how much of the broader crypto asset uh, space is covered. I mean, so much of it seems to be predicated on market cap beyond anything else. And I wonder, Rachel, I mean, you're in quite a unique position in that you cover enterprise blockchain. So I wonder if you could tell us maybe how you, what you look for in terms of enterprise blockchain when you're looking at the stories, the different value propositions, and perhaps whether you think that there's enough coverage of this, um, this enterprise blockchain in this space. I don't think there's enough coverage in terms of enterprise blockchain in this space, first of all. Um, so, and also when, with the coverage that we do have, we tend to see the same blockchains being mentioned. So for instance, in 2017, it was all about Hyperledger and private networks. Um, I covered IBM blockchain a lot. Now we're seeing enterprise Ethereum. But like I said, at this conference, I've been learning so much about BSV blockchain for enterprise. And I find it so fascinating, and I think that's a segment that we really should focus more on in terms of coverage, because it's not all about, I get it, now we're seeing the shift from private networks to public networks, but it's, all, it's not all about Ethereum. And so I think in terms of coverage, there needs to be more enterprise coverage, there needs to be better enterprise coverage, and we just can't focus on Ethereum all the time. Um, with my stories, I focus specifically on real-world use cases. So if there is an enterprise blockchain solution out there, I always ask them about the use cases behind it. How is it being used in the real world today? What problem is it solving? Do you have customers that are already using this? Because, yeah, of course, you can have an enterprise blockchain solution, but how useful is it? And, you know, so I, I like things that are good for supply chain management, for instance, tracking and tracing. Um, solving real-world problems like invoicing, risk management. I know that InChain is doing a lot of that stuff. 
right now, which is really, really interesting. Like I said, at this conference, I've learned so much about BSV blockchain and how enterprises are using it. And I think that's, that's great. And I think that deserves more coverage because like I said, a lot of the, a lot of the times we, we're reading now, at least public networks on Ethereum for enterprise. I wonder, how does that compare to your own experience, James? Projects that get overshadowed by um, outside noise, um, uh, you know, can, can you know can can affect things quite badly. And I, and it, like like Rachel, I came out to Zurich um, uh, um, earlier this year, and I met um, you know, your um, shadows, the, the the chat with the Terranode. I mean, it was completely mind blowing what he um, you know his story. And in fact, actually, it was a complete pleasure to. Um, to report on that, um, I mean, it was, uh, you know, eye-opening. Um, and I think that, you know, it's more about, you know, what, you know, th there is no one blockchain that rules them all. It's not Lord of the Rings. Each each one has their own um, specialty. Um, and I think that, you know, one of, the, one of the most important things that I've been banging the drum about always is, Look, you know, we are, I mean, look, if you look at the market cap of the entire, um, in the entire uh, crypto markets, two trillion, well, that's the same as Apple, one company. So come on, you know, we, there is a long way to go. And the only way I think really, um, and I, I mean, I, I know that people know that I'm, I'm quite close to, um, uh, you know, the Cardano lot. And one of the reasons that I like um, what they do is, is they talk about interoperability, um, sustainability and scalability. And, and I think... Those, those three elements, nobody in the industry. And I think that interoperability is a very important aspect of it. And I think that if we can, as, a, as an industry, work together, right, rather than fighting, I think a lot, could be, a lot more can be achieved a lot quicker. For your part, Jill, you've obviously had Jimmy on your show a few times who loves to talk about enterprise blockchain. Do you see the interest or the demand for this kind of story from your audience? I would say my best performing content, like I said, we, we um, cover the entire gamut of the global capital market space. My best performing content is digital assets handout, um, and it's all organic. So um, that is definitely our best performing. But I will say to, to James's point, um, I think the way at least mainstream media is covering digital assets is more of a gotcha kind of thing. Oh, you know, crypto is at 63, uh, Bitcoin is at 63,000, now it's at 35,000, and this is why you're not getting institutional adoption, and you can only have one or 2% of it in your portfolio. So, um, and we can argue that that's probably the way mainstream media is covering everything these days. So, how does the media and um, leaders in the digital asset space work together to better educate its audience? Um, because just following what one crypto is doing is not doing justice for all of the other projects that are going on in, in that space. And also to Rachel's point, not covering just the MasterCards and the Visas and so forth. Whoever thought Square 10 years ago would be where they are today relative to MasterCard and Visa and leading the way in terms of you know, payment processing and incorporating that into the digital asset space. So I think that there is a lot of education that needs to happen on the media side and then also figure out a way to work with the industry just like they work with, you know, um, executives at regular companies because uh, I think it's the only way to put the conversation forward and kind of divorce itself from one specific crypto moving forward. We haven't even touched on, on, on the explosion of DeFi during the pandemic, um, you know, the, the pandemic hiatus. I mean, it, I mean, I know it was always, it was always bubbling away, but the, the explosion has been astonishing. I mean, I met Stanny when he um, had like 40,000 bucks sort of, you know, staked. And I think there's now 21 billion um, stakes on the Arve, um protocol. And you just, you just think, wh where did that come from? This, the pace at which this industry moves. I mean, and I think both of you guys on the panel and you, Alex, um, will go, when we entered into this place, you know, blockchain, normal life, fine. Blockchain times 10 speed up. It is astonishing. And um, during the summit we just had, we, I, I, I put on a panel saying educating the grown-ups in the room. And it's literally, it's, it's, it's how the hell do we keep up? I mean, the, the regul it's regulators, everything like that. Legacy banking and financial uh, institutions are just simply terrified because they're going, well, how, how, do we, how do we adapt? How do we, you know, okay, well, let's smash that down. It's, it's, it's a very, very fast-moving and young Young, young uh, industry. I mean, the 
the Solanas of this world. I mean, the FTX. I mean, it, it, it's I mean, it's mind blowing, mind blowing. And I mean, I, I'm learning something every every day. So I'd say that the absolute takeaway is education is absolutely fundamental. You were saying it's a young industry, but I think while the enterprise news may not be as exciting as the digital asset news and prices, it's so necessary for this space because enterprise is maturing the space. When you see a company like Square or Walmart or VC, you know, adopting blockchain, that just that's how the space is maturing from my, my perspective. And it is a young space. And I think in order for the space to grow, we need enterprise adoption. There are a lot of things that, you know, people don't necessarily read or know about, but they're, they're absolutely huge with all of the main banks involved, all of the main yeah. suppliers, and, 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 you know, within, within the commodities world. It's huge. Yeah, it's huge. So enterprise plays a, a huge role in this entire space. I don't think people realize it because some people just focus on the crypto and the digital asset news, but it's like in the background, enterprise is massive. And I don't think it's going to go away either. And I have a feeling that there's no way to go back at this point. And if anything we've learned over the past 18 months, if you're not digitizing your businesses, you're just not going to be around. So I... You know, and, and to James's point, you have legacy assets and operators. It's like, you know, the person who invented the motor car, I'm sure the guys that made the wagon wheels kind of freaked out too. But there's no way that you're going back. I mean, if, you, if, we, if, if the light bulb didn't go off about digitization, at least in the past 18 months, Rachel, I'm sure you would agree, we've accelerated trends at least five to 10 years in advance. So I don't think there's any way that we're going back. You cover enterprise blockchain as, as your profession. That's your, your main mandate. And you say you've come here to this conference and you've learned so much, your eyes have been opened to BSV. What can we in the BSV ecosystem do to improve that paradigm so more people are understanding the, the very unique value proposition offered by the BSV blockchain? Yeah, so I mean, like I said, I didn't know much about BSV blockchain in terms of enterprise use until I came to this conference. So education is key. Conferences like this is key. Um, getting your PR or your marketing, like internal, external, whatever, to start sending press releases out to the journalists that cover enterprise, such as myself, like do the research, figure out who covers that. That's so important. And, you know, I, I'm not a fan of press releases because I just don't think that they're like the best news source. But what I do like about them is that they, they make me aware of that company to reach out, to get comments, to do some research. So that's what I think. I think just education and more conferences, more press releases, and that will help the word get out about BSV blockchain. Any, any advice that you'd like to add, James? No particular advice. I just think that, um, I think we're all doing, I think, I think just crack on with what we're doing, do the research, keep it real, um, keep it valid, keep it verified. <laughs> you know, let's just make sure that we report things sensibly and do things correctly. And last word for you, Jill, anything that you'd add to that? Yeah, I would just have to say that the kind of work that James and what Rachel are doing where we have these different segments of the crypto space is really helpful for those of us that are covering it and being able to leverage the experience of experts such as this and to just keep doing what you're doing. Because like I said, we're not going back to the way that things were. Well, that's all we've got time for today. So could I get a, a round of applause for my fantastic panelists, Thank please? Thank you.
Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin wallet, blockchain, stablecoins, metanet, the evolution of money. Everybody is talking about Bitcoin today. But what exactly is it? Learn the basics from experts. Learn what Bitcoin is, how it works, and why it matters. Bitcoin 101, your ultimate guide to the fundamentals of blockchain.